so yeah, so thanks for uh, coming here. Um, I'll talk about Cambridge Analytica. How many of you have heard of Cambridge Analytica? Okay, so great. I can go quickly over the first part and focus on the my data side of, of this. So I'll tell you it's slightly more personal then because a lot of you have heard of Cambridge Analytica. Um, a while ago, early 2015, I thought, how can I push the my data idea? And I thought, well, every four years, there's an election in the US, and we hear about all the great data mining that took place to help the president get elected. It's always the same pattern. And I figured, well, this is a good opportunity to actually tell people about the data mining in another way, in another way that doesn't buy into the PR completely. So it was very strategic, actually. And in December 2015, so uh, quite a, a bit later, there was an article in The Guardian about Ted Cruz <laughs> the campaign using data that was harvested from millions of Facebook users by a company called Cambridge Analytica. It was a great article, and it immediately tapped into something I already knew, um, some research that had been done at Cambridge University on profiling people on psychographics scales. So what's that? Well, it's some form of metrics that are constructed on individuals to try to build profiles that inform about their psychology. So basically, there are five dimensions, the five main principal dimensions that help inform someone, that help in inform about the psychology of someone, how open you are, how agreeable you are, how neurotic you are, etc. And it turns out that some research from Cambridge University from only 2013, 2014, so not that old, shows that this can be done very, very efficiently with just Facebook likes. So the graph on the right, I can explain it later, but basically, if you, if you know 10 likes about someone, you know that person at a psychographic level better than a coworker. I think it's 70 for a friend and 150 for a partner and 200 better than yourself, something like that. So it's completely realistic, automated, and you can do it at a very large scale. So I started investigating. I started really thinking, well, okay, this is at Cambridge University. This, in the original Gaydon article, they explained that some data had flowed from Cambridge University to Cambridge Analytica. So I started investigating through freedom of information requests to Cambridge University and asking them like tough questions about who is this researcher that took data from one to the other? Um, what did you investigate? Were there ethics, uh, panels involved? What kind of investigation took place? And they basically stole everywhere they could. Cambridge University was really far from transparent. So this is a track on transparency, on ethics. First failure is really Cambridge University that really, really prevented me from digging deeper. And they should have disclosed this because this is public information in a way, or information produced in the public interest. Then I contacted journalists, and this led to an article on the left in the Tagesanzeiger, the most circulated article in 2016 in German, on ger German social media. It was translated into many languages, so the mid one in the middle is in Norwegian, same thing, most circulated article of 2016, and then in English, um, advice explaining really what happened in detail. So I had had access to more documents and helped the journalist uh, understand what could have happened at a technical level, documented it, did a lot of research. So what actually happened? Well, Cambridge Analytica bought data from a lot of different sources, that you can see here, um, data brokers, etc. It also collected a lot of data in very illegal ways on Facebook through social engineering, uh, crowdsourced via Amazon Mechanical Turk. So it's a really, really complex process to collect a ton of data and basically build a huge model of people's psychometric psychometrics. Also, other factors such as it's the need for cognition, so for instance, how much do you think before you actually take a decision, or how impulsive you are, how much do you react based on your own emotions. They really try to, to, to rank people according to all those different scales. And then of course, they target people individually. So they project a bunch of messages on Facebook to each individual, and they see what kind of effect it has, and they amplify some messages for some crowds that are homogeneous at a psychographic level and some others, and I'll see what they can do. And of course, if they do slightly better than their opponent in terms of targeting, Facebook will amplify that advantage because it's in the own interest of Facebook to do that, right? But if someone's targeting slightly more precise than the other, Facebook detects that. We get more revenue from that person's targeting, so we'll help them target more. 
So here is more evidence. These are videos from Cambridge Analytica on the left showing the, the so this is from one of their videos that shows that they really use this technique. On the right, this is a flyer where they present their work and they explicitly describe using Facebook likes to do psychographics. Um, this is an internal video that shows one of their employees reading a paper and then when you do on go on Google Scholar, you know, you go full CSI, enhance, <laughs> enhance, enhance, you find the paper and the paper shows that it's about, it's a very technical paper on how to measure people on the need for cognition scale. So how gullible people are essentially. That's what this is really trying to do. Then I switched to England because this company had also worked in England. So I worked with this journalist, Carol Cadbuller, who wrote an article about the data, how the data flowed in the UK for Brexit, the Brexit campaign, and how also the money flowed into the companies that were processing the data. And that's really interesting because um, there's one billionaire, essentially Robert Mercer, that's behind two big companies. So he's uh, investing a lot of money or um, uh, donating money to candidates that then immediately use the services of those same companies. And it's the same data companies that are staying behind several of the groups in the Leave campaign that were supposed to be um, disjoint, not collaborate. But it turns out that they have the same donor, they have the same databases in the back end. So essentially they are all collaborating on the data, but not really financially necessarily. So it took a while to get journalists to understand that this was actually illegal in electoral law. And this is what's being pursued now um, by several different investigations, one by the Electoral Commission, one that by the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK. Um, so they're trying to see what they can do. And part of the challenge is for the two of them to start talking, the, those two organizations to start talking. Because they're not used to, the Electoral Commission is not used to look at data. But now they're starting to talk to the Information Commissioner to see uh, what might have happened. At the same time, from the Information Commissioner's point of view, the processing that took place is processing of sensitive data. Um, Cambridge Analytica is based in the UK, but processed data about US citizens in the US election. That's also illegal, in my view, and I think most people's view, in the UK data protection law. So there is, um, the, that's the UK ICO has started to investigate the role of data in the US election. So that's really reverse privacy shield for those who know about that. So a big mess, essentially. But, but I presented a lot of evidence, etc. But what happens on the other side? On the other side is that this company clearly engaged into a huge PR campaign trying to feed information to journalists. You know, we have 15 different anonymous sources that tell us that that article is not true. But they don't present any evidence. They qualify their words. And the ultimate explanation actually makes no sense because they say essentially they didn't have time to use psychographics in the Trump campaign. Actually, they had plenty of time to use it in the Cruz campaign. All the data from the Cruz campaign went into the Trump campaign. And anyway, the technique I described using Facebook likes to, takes a millisecond per profile to profile the individual. So it's not a question of time to use those purely data-driven techniques. Oh my God. Okay, and so that's an ethical failure because when challenged by the press, when challenged by journalists asking questions, even individuals asking questions, um, they fail to disclose. And their obligations, in terms of their legal obligations, but then there are certainly ethical obligations as well, of disclosing what you're doing with the data. And that's one step. But then if you're, it's another to lie, right? So that's yet another layer that where they fail. And it's the same at Facebook, actually, because Facebook has denied that data was stolen from them to go on to um, Cambridge Analytica. But at the same time, I've seen documents where Facebook has asked Cambridge Analytica to delete the data they had stolen. So to journalists, they will say one thing, but then there are documents that say the exact opposite. Now, this conference about my data, what's the link? Well, I think that actually, in these situations, citizens have a lot of powers, a lot of different rights that they can use to help make the situation better. But there is a problem. The problem is that journalists don't know yet about those rights. That's one thing. You tell them and they suddenly discover, what, I can do that? That's one thing. And the second thing is that journalists hate to be part of the story. 
So the only cases where they like to be part of the story is when they sue the state to get access to public documents. Then they love it. But they will never sue a private company, or they won't do that yet, to sue a private company themselves to get access to their personal data. So they need to have other people who will do that. And then they are happy to write about that process. But it involves several actors, and you have to get them together and do something. Right? So citizens and individuals have power. So that's what I was trying to do for a while. I started documenting the procedure to ask for your data from Cambridge Analytica, and with the idea of interesting US citizens into that. Corey Doctorow basically sent people to my blog, telling them you should try that. Then a few people tried. Um, and this guy in particular, who is very vocal on Twitter, um, he basically was successful. I helped him a lot. And in the end, so his tweet got a thousand retweets when he started announcing that he did get his data. And the response in itself is extremely interesting for many, many different reasons. So here is this political profile, illegal in the UK. Cambridge Analytica just shot itself in the foot. This is evidence that they are processing sensitive data. They've never obtained consent. That's illegal. That's it. It clarifies the question. They respond with a letter that avoids answering all the questions that have been asked, like what's the source of your data, what's the destination, etc. So that's a problem. It's signed by someone who has ties with Russian oligarchs. Mm -hmm. There have been lots and lots of questions about the roles of Ro Russian oligarchs behind um, Cambridge Analytica. When asked directly by journalists, they say, we're a private company, we don't have to disclose our investors. But it turns out that in this letter, well, this guy signed. This is, you know, it sounds trivial, but it's a really important piece of information for a lot of journalists. Um, they're answering as Cambridge Analytica and not as SCL, the parent company. This has implications in all kinds of ways. So how they present themselves in this circumstance is really important, etc., etc. So you can derive a ton of information there. They don't talk about their, the psychographic profile itself, failure in data protection law. They don't talk about the source of the data that led to this profiling, another failure, etc., etc. Et so it's not just about access. There's many more. They're failing all over the place. They even pitch now for a job of a data protection officer, especially with experience interacting with the information commissioner's office. So they're starting to feel a bit of heat. Mm -hmm. And now there is a lawyer that stepped up, a solicitor in the UK, to say, well, this is a human rights issue. I'll help you build a class action lawsuit out of it. Mm -hmm. So now this is being done. And there's one solicitor, two barristers in the UK, who are building the case with this person as a representative. And potentially the class is 200 million people, all the US electorate. So this really started with just an email, right? that second part. It's this guy asking for his data. He just needed to know how, etc., etc. Now, trying another angle, if this data ended up being used on Facebook, Facebook has to say how it was used. Right? So there is lots of transparency in, at Facebook. It ranks pretty high, actually, in those rankings compared to other companies. It's all relative, right? But um, there are tools that are embedded in Facebook that allow you to download your archive, for instance, that uh, Ilana didn't talk about, but you can download your archive. You can also ask directly questions to, to Facebook. You're not respecting the law in this aspect. I would like to know more about me. So I started doing that, and I started asking, OK, how am I being targeted on Facebook? Who are the advertisers who have uploaded my email address, signaling to Facebook, do you know about me? Right? Facebook is great for that because everyone uses it, of course. All the advertisers do. So it's kind of the watering hole where everyone goes. Right? <coughs> and they, for a while they stalled, they stalled. So I'm like, OK, well, I'll escalate it. A privacy shield. I can go into arbitration court. So I started doing that. When I called for a judge, when they, at some point, Facebook was like, we don't understand. We're compliant. But they had actually changed in the background the tool for extracting their data. So now the tool has changed for two, 1 billion people or something like that. So if you go on Facebook now, you can download your archive. You can see the list of advertisers who have uploaded your email address. And that's just, again, just an email. Um, another effort, so this was a second effort. No, a third one. Um, back in the UK, 
journalists can also or journalists or individuals can also subscribe themselves to mailing lists of politicians with the express intent of providing data to the politicians so that they can do then access requests, ask the politicians for what information they have about them. And you get all kinds of interesting things like this one, okay, you register yourself to the leave the EU list and you get emails about you know country first, party second, etc. etc. And at the bottom of the email you get an ad for car insurance. Turns out that one of the big founders of Leave.eu is has uh, an insurance company, and he's using, he's mixing the data from both. He's mus mixing the staff from both because, of course, insurance companies are used to profiling people. So he's using the same techniques in the political domain, and that's extremely interesting in itself. Also, a violation of data protection law. Another effort that I was minorly involved with at the beginning, but it really started as a consequence of the previous, e the previous events. You know, the Brexit campaign happens, the, the Brexit, um, Brexit happens, then there is this reporting about the data, how it was used during the Brexit campaign, and then a few months later, there's the general election in the UK. So a lot of people were like, what can we do about this? The general election is coming, what if they work? So there's this initiative called Who Targets Me? It's a browser extension that people install, and then it watches what ads Facebook plays for you. And then who targets me collects the ads, just the ads that you're seeing, and then shares it with a ton of different people. Journalists, the information the commissioner's office, the electoral commission, to try to see what's really happening in the political Facebook sphere. Right. So this has led to actually a lot of coverage as well. Now they're helping with the German election. So it's great empowerment for users to actually be able to help in understanding what's happening around the democratic process. Another effort now is with following the data from electoral rolls. So in the whole procedure, how do those, all those companies align their data? Well, they align it on electoral rolls. So actually, in many European countries, you can go to your local county or whatever, and you can ask as an individual for the list of all voters and their address, their date of birth. You can ask for all this information. But you can only ask it for electoral purposes. So what you can do as a journalist or an individual is freedom of information request to the local, to the local offices everywhere and ask who asked for that personal data. And from there, you can start tracing. So it's a whole methodology around this. But it's really interesting in tracing how personal data is used. So I want to share a few core lessons, maybe, um, in system 102. So there's a lot of collective interest in protecting personal data as it translates into political power. That's what the Cambridge Analytica story shows, really. The new techniques that are possible for, for in, to investigate this, but they are difficult. And to go back to the ethics, it's extremely difficult to address companies on moral, ethical, or even legal grounds around personal data in particular circumstances. Thank you.